namo bhagavate vasute vaya Yarunat suti kakaram Shadayana nastra yojitai Tiryak urdvam adapartash Shakara sharapanjadam Enveloped Sutika Agaram, the house where the birth was taking place, Shadai with arrows, Nana various Astra to missiles, Yojitai. Attached, Tiryak, horizontally, Urdvam, upwards, Adha, downwards, Parta, Arjun, Chakara, made, Shara, of arrows, Panjaram, a cage. Arjuna fenced in the house where the birth was taking place by shooting arrows attached to various missiles. Thus the son of Prita constructed a protective cage of arrows covering the house upwards, downwards, and sideways. Tata Kumara Sanjato Viprapatnya Rudan Muhu Sadyo Darshanamape De Sasariro Vihayasa. The Brahmin's wife then gave birth, but after the newborn infant had been crying for a short time, he suddenly vanished into the sky in his self same body. Tadahavi provijayam vinindam krishna sanidhau modyam pashyata meho yoham shradadhe klibakatanam. The Brahmin then derided Arjuna in front of Lord Krishna. The Brahmin then derided Arjuna in front of Lord Krishna. Just see how foolish I was to put my faith in the bragging of a eunuch. Naprajumno nani rudho naramo na chakeshavaha yasya seku paritratum konyastad aviteshwaraha. When neither Prajumana, Aniruddha, Ram, or Keshava can save a person, who else can possibly protect him? Dig Arjuna Mrishabhadam, dig Atma Slagano Danuhu, Daivop Pasristam Yo Modyad, Ani Nishati Durmati. To hell with that liar, Arjuna. I'm not saying that, I'm reading. I'm reading from Srimad Bhagavatam. To hell with that braggart's bow. He is so foolish that he has deluded himself into thinking that he can bring back a person whom destiny has taken away. Evam sapati viprashau vidyam asthaya palgunaha yayo samyamanim asu yatraste bhagavan yamaha. 
while the wise Brahmin continued to heap insults upon him, Arjuna employed a mystic incantation to go at once to Samyamani, the city of the city of heaven where Lord Yamaraj resides. <clears throat> Not seeing the Brahmin's child there, Arjuna went to the cities of Agni, Nirti, Soma, Vayu, and Varuna. With weapons at the ready, he searched through all the domains of the universe, from the bottom of the subterranean region to the roof of heaven. Finally, not finding, not having found the Brahmin son anywhere, Arjuna decided to enter the sacred fire, having failed to keep his promise. But just as he was about to do so, Lord Krishna stopped him and spoke the following words. Purport. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti comments that Arjuna trusted Lord Shiva implicitly as his guru, so he did not bother to search out Lord Shiva's celestial abode. Hare Krishna. Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam. Canto 10, chapter 89, entitled Krishna and Arjuna Retrieve a Brahman Son. Text. So many texts, 37 through 44. Shukadeva Goswami explained just a few chapters previous the story of the Shamantaka jewel, wherein in the city of Dwarka, where Krishna is Dwarkadish, Dwarkanath. Yadubhati, the presiding Lord, is his own abode among his own family members. He was accused of being a thief. He was accused by Satrajit. And Satrajit, who was a very powerful, intelligent person, having had the proprietorship of the Shamantaka jewel, he was also extremely wealthy. And of course, with wealth comes power and influence. He was spreading these rumors against Krishna, and people were talking all around. Ultimately, Krishna restored the truth. Satrajit, understanding the offense he made, he presented the jewel to Krishna as well as his own beloved daughter, Satyabhama, to Krishna. Krishna gave the jewel back to him, but kept his daughter. So here we find a similar situation in Dwarka. In the previous verses, Shukadev Goswami tell us, tells us about a Brahman, the husband and wife of this family gave birth to a child just after birth. As soon as they placed the child on the ground, 
he died. Due to the grief, the Brahman besides, him, besides himself, he brought his dead infant and placed him at the step of the doorway to King Ugrasena's court. And he lamented. He was in such a miserable state. He wasn't just speaking words, he was crying with extreme emotion. He was declaring that Ugrasena, the grandfather of Krishna, was the enemy of the Brahmins. That he had no power to protect the Brahmins. That he was greedy. That he couldn't control his senses. And that because of this, the whole dynasty of Dwarka was going to go down into hellish conditions. He put all the blame of his son's death on the king. His wife gave birth to a second child. The child died instantly. The third child died. Every one of those children, year after year, was placed on the doorstep of Ugrasena's palace. The court means the public area where the king meets everyone. It was a very powerful declaration. And each time he said the same song of sorrow, anger. When the ninth of his children died, he again came publicly and put it in Ugrasena's doorstep. And again, in a lamenting tone, he was screaming out his criticism. At that time, Arjuna happened to be with Lord Keshava, and he heard this. He saw what was going on. Please understand the blasphemy of King Ugrasena was a blasphemy of Krishna himself. He's blaming Ugrasena because you are the king, you are responsible for everyone's well being. If there's any problem, it's the king's fault. Krishna's Yadupati. He's Dwarka Dish. He's Dwarka Nath. He's the Lord of all of Dwarka. When the demigods come to Dwarka, they don't come to see Ugrasena. They come to see Krishna. This is Krishna's abode. Krishna created Dwarka by his own sweet will. When Jarasandara with so many Akshohini divisions of soldiers were attacking Mathura and Kaliavana was also attacking from another direction. Krishna created Dwarka in the ocean. And when all of the Yadus went to sleep in Mathura, they woke up the next morning in beautiful palaces in Dwarka. There wasn't any need for um, carrying all of their possessions all their possessions were in their palaces too in Dwarka. So Krishna is the controller of Dwarka. So indirectly, he's holding Ugrasena Krishna responsible for the death of nine of his children. And he's speaking very loudly from his heart his dissatisfaction 
calling them enemies of Brahmins. We praise Krishna, Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmana Hitaya Cha Jagat Hitaya Krishnaya Go Vindaya Namo Nama. That the Brahmins are very dear to him, as are the cows. And for Krishna to blaspheme a devotee hurts him even more than if we blaspheme him. The first offense to the holy name of Krishna is to blaspheme devotees. That takes precedent over even saying something against Krishna himself. Madhbhakta puja vyadika. Krishna is more pleased when we glorify his devotees because devotees are more dear to Krishna than Krishna is to himself. This is a basic principle of Vaishnavism to understand this. Gopi paratur padakamalayora das das anudas. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna himself. Yesterday we celebrated beautiful Radhayatra in Shivaji Park. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was about to begin his beautiful kirtan and dancing in front of Jagannath's chariot, he offered this verse, his prayer, Naham vipro na cha narapatirna pibaishona shudro. I'm not a Brahman or a Kshatri or a Vaishya or a Shudra. I'm not a Brahmachari, Grihasta, Vana, Prastra, Sanyasi. Kintu Protya Nikila Paramananda Punamrata Bhair Gopi Bharatur Padakamalayora Das Das Anutas. I'm the servant of the servant of the servant of the Lord of Gopis, Sri Krishna. Vrindavan Das Thakur declares that the highest, the highest title anyone can possibly hope for, pray for, what to speak of attain in the entire universal creation is the title Das, to be the servant of Krishna. It's higher than being a king, a prime minister, a president, a CEO, a PhD, a quadruple PhD. It's higher than being an Olympic gold medalist, a world champion. Das, to be the servant of the Lord. This is the highest because it's the highest truth. Jivera Swarupoy Krishna, Krishnera Nitya Das. It's the constitutional nature of the soul. And even the all conquering Achuta, who is unlimited, imperishable. Mayadhyakshena prakriti sugyate sacharachara, who is the source of all material energy. Aham sarvasya prabhavo mata sarvam pravartate, who is the source of all spiritual and material worlds, the father and mother of every living being. Krishna himself, sarvaloka maheshwaram, the proprietor of everything that exists. Whose existence through his energies is all pervading within and without everything and everyone. That Krishna is subordinate to the love of his servant. In this way, Vrindavan Das Thakur explains there's nothing greater than to actually live 
in the spirit of the servant of the Lord. To value any other position is illusion. Srila Prabhupada gave example that the value of zero is nothing. The value of ten zeros, hundred zeros, million zeros, you can add them, multiply them, it's still zero. Its value is nothing. But if you put one in front of those zeros, however many zeros follow the one, increases the value. Now what is that one? Utilizing our abilities, our wealth, our knowledge, our influence in the service of the Lord. That one is das, to be the servant. To serve means to serve with love. When we speak the word das, in bhakti, it doesn't mean like someone in India you may hire to wash your pots, or wash your clothes, or drive your car, or take care of your gardens. That's a type of servant. But das, in this sense means savai pung sang paro dharma yatho bhakti radhokshe che hoite ki aprati hata yagatma suprasidit samsadir haditoshana to serve without ulterior motives to serve without conditions of what I'm going to get in return of whether it's difficult or easy, of who is going to recognize me. To serve as an expression of our gratitude, our faith, and our love for Krishna, for Krishna's pleasure. So for those of you who may have been given initiation, most important part of the word, sometimes they're the names of Krishna, sometimes the name of Krishna's associates or holy places. But we are Das. We are the servant. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he extended this even greater as the whole Srimad Bhagavatam declares an even higher post of being the servant of Krishna is to be the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. Because Krishna is most pleased when we please those who love him. In the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, when Gopa Kumar returns to the spiritual world, Krishna with great emotion embraces him says, you have lived in this world, in the material world, and you, under, you had to undergo so many trials and tribulations and challenges of every types of varieties, and you remained faithful to me through it all. I am so indebted. I am so grateful. Only for my sake you went through all that. Krishna's in our hearts. Krishna's a person. He's not just an all-pervading energy. He's a person who's the very source of this all-pervading energy. Who's all attractive. Ishvara Parama Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigra. Anadiradir Govinda Saravakarana Karanam. The universe's topmost authority on truth, Lord Brahma. 
he has begun his prayers with this verse. Ishwara Parama. Srila Prabhupada explains everyone is, a, is an Ishwara in some way or another. A little ant is an Ishwara over the little um, piece of food that he might be carrying. We all are Ishwaras of something or someone. But Krishna is Ishwara Parama. He's the supreme controller. To me Sarveshwareshwara Prachandra Kumara Thakur Bhakti Vinod. He begins a prayer that Krishna is the controller of all controllers. His form is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. He's the cause of all causes. He's the source of everything that exists. That is Govinda. The deepest truth of all the Vedas is to understand how Krishna, who's the source of all love, through his Ladini Shakti, Sri Radha. He feels genuinely subordinate to the love of the devotee. That is the power of bhakti. When Krishna comes to this world, he comes to, to give us what will conquer him. This is an extraordinary concept. Usually people don't like to be conquered. Yada yada hidaramasya. Krishna comes to this world again and again and again to teach us how we can conquer him. And that's when he's most happy. And how do we conquer him? By showing love and gratitude to his devotees. So Krishna, he's hearing nine times in a row how his beloved grandfather, Ugrasena, is being seriously criticized. Krishna himself is being criticized. When Arjuna hears this, he has to do something about it. He can't just think, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a visitor here, I'm going back to Hastinapur. He takes responsibility. He said, what you're saying is true. If someone is the king, they are responsible for a person's good fortune. And also responsible if things go wrong. But I am here. And I will not allow this to happen. I will protect your next child. The Brahman, he's really, really disoriented, heartbroken. Can you imagine? He has no children. Nine children in a row have died right after birth. He says to Arjuna, challenges him, who do you think you are? He calls him a bragger. It's hard to even say, but I'm quoting the Brahman. <laughs> He's so upset. This is a Brahman. He says, to hell with that liar, Arjuna. He's... Can, he's cursing Arjuna to go to hell. <laughs> he says, to hell with that liar, Arjuna. To hell with that braggart's bow. And 
And he's saying he's foolish, he's deluded. But Arjuna, he's very much strong. He says, no, no, I will protect. The Brahman says, Shankarshan, Pradumana, Vasudev, Aniruddha, they're all here living in Dwarka. They couldn't help. Even Krishna couldn't help. And you say that you can help? Arjuna said, I'm not Shankarshan, I'm not even Krishna. I am Arjun. And I have the mighty Gandiba bow. I have even passed the test and been given the endorsement of Lord Shiva. I defeated him. And he gave me the mantras of the Pashupat weapons. If I do not protect your children, I vow I will enter into fire and end my life. So the Brahmin had a little confidence when Arjuna said that. <laughs> Short time later, the Brahmin comes running to Arjuna because he's really desperate. Now it's his tenth child. He's saying, my wife is about to give a baby. Please protect that child. Arjuna said, I will protect. Arjuna came to his house, or the, the house where the wife was giving birth to the child. And we have read in today's verses, with his, he's chanting these mantras to get Lord Shiva's blessings. Why? Because he wants to give the Brahman confidence. The Brahman lost his confidence in Krishna. <laughs> so Arjuna says, I'm going to use Shiva's weapons, Pashupat. <laughs> and <laughs> he starts shooting these arrows. And with his arrows, he makes a fence and then a cage around the whole house to protect it from anyone, even death personified, from getting in. It was such a thorough cage with missiles between the arrows. It covered the house from below, from above, and from all sides. And within that well-constructed cage of missiles and arrows, and Arjuna was standing right there with his Gandiba bow, waiting for any danger to come. I think that may have been staged <laughs> by a higher power. <laughs> we, we cannot stage things so expertly as what Krishna can do. So Arjuna was right there. Now this was serious, because when Arjuna says that if this child dies, I will enter into the sacred fire and take my life. That's absolute. He will never... Arjuna was an honest Vaishnav and a Kshatriya. For a Kshatriya, dishonor is worse than death. It's not that he would find some... Um, like many astrologers, they'll tell you what's going to happen, and if it doesn't happen, they say, no, actually, I told you this, but you didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and because of this and this and this, that happened and this happened and like that. Arjuna was going to enter fire. So it was very serious. And plus, he's a devotee of Krishna. So his reputation is Krishna's reputation. So he's, with all of his powers, with every bit of alertness, he's there to protect that child. And the child is born. 
and something incredible happened that didn't happen with any of the other children. The child cried, which seemed really auspicious. But then after crying for a few seconds, the child floated into the air and disappeared. He's dead. The Brahmin was beside himself. Even you, Arjuna, could not protect. You are, you are so proud, you are thinking that you can protect a person from destiny. Arjuna said, I will find that child. Wherever I have to go, I will find all your children. And with his supernatural yogic powers, he went to the abode of Yamaraj. He went to the abode of Chandra, Bayu, Varuna, Indra, <coughs> Brahma. He went all over the universe. The only abode he didn't go to was Shiva's. That's what our purport is today. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, because he was doing it in the name of Shiva, and he was using Shiva's Pashupat mantra for his weapons, it was understood that Shiva's not going to take the child. But he went everywhere else. Arjuna was feeling so distressed, he could not help this person. He actually was really, really in distress, and decided, now I must enter into the sacred fire. Krishna, he tells Arjuna, please don't be distressed about this. Don't be so hard on yourself. Just come with me. And this is the verses to come. But although the verses are coming, I'm going to Eco Village, so I'm going to speak a little ahead. Krishna tells Arjuna, get on my chariot. Arjuna boards Krishna's chariot. Krishna's four horses, they're traveling very fast. And they go through the entire universe. And then the layer of the universe is complete darkness. Outside of the universe is the Brahma Jyoti. Inside the universe is the, is the light of the sun. But in between, it's gigantic area of total darkness. No light at all. So as they come out of the inner part of the sunlit universe, they're going through the... It's so dark, no one can see anything. And it's really a huge distance. And Krishna's horses, they can't see. Krishna's going, to go, go, and they're <laughs> total darkness. So nothing is an impediment for Krishna. Krishna releases Sudarshan, his chakra, which is filled with light. And Sudarshan is, go, is leading the way in front of the horses, illuminating all directions, and the horses are very happy, and they're just following Sudarshan chakra. And they go through the outer layer of the entire universe and enter into the Brahma Jyoti. We just chanted from Brahma Samhita how from Krishna's transcendental body, this infinite, all-pervading light, the Brahma Jyoti, is emanating. We could, um, if you think of it in this way, try, we can't even imagine. But what, what is Krishna's body like? 
if just the, the halo, the light that's emanating from his body is the all-pervading Brahman. Jnanis, many various form, types of yogis, their ultimate goal is to enter into that Brahma Jyoti, Mukti. It's everywhere. It's inside everything. Brahma Jyoti inside everything, outside everything. It's limitless. The whole cosmic manifestation is just like a little cloud within the limitless, endless sky of the Brahma Jyoti, the spiritual sky. It is all emanating from Krishna's body. And yet Krishna appears like a little cowherd boy. Not only appears, but the Brahma Jyoti is coming from that little cowherd boy form. Yashodamai is thinking, and worrying when Krishna goes to herd the calves and the cows. He, he may step on a stone and hurt his soft feet, or there may be too much heat that causes him to, his skin to be too hot, or the, a cow may step on him or a bull may accidentally hit him with his horn, or there's, there's monkeys around, they may scratch him or bite him. And there's dogs and cats that might hurt him. She's worrying. She's seeing his body as the softest, most vulnerable little body that she needs to protect. Yet from his body is coming the whole existence. So they enter into the Brahma Jyoti. And Krishna keeps going through his, um, on his chariot until they ultimately come within this limitless ocean of light. The Srimad Bhagavatam tells that Arjuna, he couldn't even keep his eyes open. The light was so bright. He had to close them. And then he saw within that light, magnificent palace that was the source of all this light. So many beautiful jewels. And within the palace is Anantashesha. This limitlessly beautiful serpent. It's hard for us to imagine a beautiful serpent. <laughs> but that's because we don't have transcendental vision. The little serpents that are around us, they don't, they're not really so beautiful. In fact, usually serpents they cause us to be very much afraid. Just recently, we had a medical conference in the um, Sahara Hotel, Bhaktivedant Hospital, and there was probably six, seven hundred doctors there medical practitioners, wellness coaches, CEOs and directors of hospitals. And one of the people that was given an award, he was given an award. He's a very simple Maharashtrian gentleman, but he's really intelligent. He's, he's a medical person. And he, more than anyone else, he made breakthroughs in, in curing people from snake bites. 
So afterward, we were talking for some time, half, you know, during a break in the conference. And he told me something very interesting. He said, there's a particular um, village in Maharashtra which had a very high rate of people being spitten by snakes. And 30 to 40% of the people bitten by snakes died. He said, in that village, it's half Hindu and half Muslim. And practically every person who was bitten by the snake was a Hindu. (laughs) There's practically no Muslims that get bit by snakes there. I'm just repeating what he told me, and he's, <laughs> he's probably the highest authority in the world on snake bites. <laughs> so for those of you who are very proud of your hin- Hindutva, <laughs> I'm going to give you an explanation. <laughs> Satisfy your hearts. Because, you know, I was even kind of like that. I would say, why is this? <laughs> why only the Hindus get bit by the snakes and die? <laughs> and he said, because of a terrorist snake. <laughs> This, this is exactly what he told me. Sometimes swamis are known for using an imaginative ways of explaining things, but I'm telling you exactly what the authority told me. <laughs> he said because of the terrorist snake. And he went in graphic detail about how this snake was a terrorist. And he started explaining the strategy of how terrorists work. He said, you don't know they're coming till it's too late. And he said, there's a particular snake called a crate. And what they do is they come in your house when you're sleeping. and they bite you, but they don't leave marks, and they don't even wake you up, but the poison is ferocious. So when you do wake up, if you wake up, (laughs) while I'm telling this story, I'm simultaneously trying to think of how I'm going to connect this to the story. <laughs> <laughs> you have these intense um, pains in your intestines. And you go to the hospital, and the hospital treats you for intestinal disease, because they, there's no trace of the snake. And then you die. So he told me what he did, and it's amazing. It practically eradicated all the Hindus from being bitten by snakes or dying of snake bites. Should I tell? In very sophisticated medical vocabulary, he told me, that the Muslims in that village sleep on beds and the Hindus sleep on the floor. (laughs) And the snakes can't get to your bed, but when you're sleeping on the floor, they, they just come looking for some little rat or something to eat, and then you move and they go, and then you die. 
He said, he just went and convinced all the people to use beds. <laughs> no, I don't want to corrupt our brahmacharis. <laughs> Even I sleep on the floor here. But there's no crates here. At least not that we've seen. And then he went to the hospitals. And he went to every hospital in that village and said, if anyone comes with these intestinal things, don't treat their intestines. Give them anti-venom serums. And he told them which ones to give. And in this way, there's practically no bites and almost no one dies even if they do. And I was thinking, this is a simple man, and there's so many big, big doctors and everything, and this person just has common sense. (laughs) (laughs) And common sense really works. And I told him, you know, why don't you come to our eco-village and teach everyone all these? So he said, yes, yes, I will come. (laughs) So, to make the connection. (laughs) Snakes, people, when they look at, they don't like, we don't like to see snakes. Because they represent death. They cause fear. But here is Anantashesha, and he's a serpent, and he has thousands of hoods, and each hood has two eyes, but yet he's infinitely beautiful. When you see Anantashesha, you don't feel fear, you feel total eternal protection. Arjuna is looking up, and Krishna is looking up at this, this enormous serpent, Ananda Shesha. And Ananda Shesha just looks so totally happy. He's giving stability, security, and shelter for all living beings who take shelter of him. And there, sitting on the bed of Ananda Shesha, is Mahavishnu, the gigantic form of the first Purusha. Within this Karuna Dakshai Vishnu, within the whole cosmic manifestation, it is Mahavishnu who's the source of everything. Krishna bows down to Mahavishnu. Arjuna bows down to Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu smiles. And he's so happy to see Krishna and Arjuna. He says to Arjuna, actually, I'm the one who took all the ten children from the Brahmins. (laughs) I took them for one reason only because I wanted to see Krishna, (laughs) and I wanted to see you. So you came here, and now I'm seeing you. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is asking a simple question. Why? Why would he cause so much distress to a Brahmin just to see Krishna? Because Mahavishnu sees everything, everywhere. Certainly he sees what's going on in Dwarka. Why does he need to do all this? This is Lila. Krishna knows everything. Krishna can do everything. But yet when he comes to this world, he takes the role of a human being. In the sense, it's not that he's Narottam, he's the supreme being. 
but still he takes the role where he appears vulnerable just to attract our love. Krishna was in the coils of Kaliya and he seemed completely trapped for quite a long time. He was just without movement. And this is another serpent, Kaliya. If Kaliya comes, it doesn't matter whether you're sleeping in a bed or the floor. <laughs> Kaliya is so powerful. Yes, even the birds, they weren't even going to sleep. They were flying in the sky and just the vapors from Kaliya's breath were poisoning them and causing them to fall dead. So Kali is holding Krishna in his coils, squeezing to kill him. And the Brijabhasis are seeing this, and they're falling. And Yashoda Mai, the mother, she's a lady, and Kali is this massive, multi-hooded poison snake. And she was about to jump in the poisonous water and personally come and fight the snake just to protect Krishna even though she knew there was no hope that she could do anything, but she would rather die than do nothing. That's a mother's love. And the cowherd boys, they were about to jump in, and Nanda Maharaj, and Balaram, he stopped them. He was, he was laughing. He said, I'm Ananta Shesha. Krishna never plays with me like this. How fortunate is this Kaliya? To Krishna, he's nothing but a most insignificant little water snake. The cows, the calves, they're literally on the verge of death seeing Krishna in this condition. And when Krishna, after increasing their, their love for him in this way, he expands his body just a little and then slips out of the coils and jumps on Kaliya's hood and starts dancing. How he danced. Kaliya's moving so fast. He's trying to bite Krishna. He actually did bite Krishna. He's trying to devour Krishna with these gigantic fangs or sharp teeth. So much poison. And all of his hoods are attacking Krishna on one hood. And Krishna's dancing, smiling. Such a beautiful dance. No one has ever seen a dance like this. We have seen dancing, musicians dance, dancers dance, actors dance. But when Krishna dances, he's Vrindava Natabara. He's the king of all the dancers of Vrindava. He was dancing so gracefully, so graciously. And what was the stage? This curved, slippery hood of a snake. And now, you know, the residents of Vrindavan, they're completely afraid that if Krishna takes one one misstep, <laughs> Kali is going to devour him. But yet at the same time, they're so mesmerized, spellbound, and ecstatic love seeing Krishna dancing. They don't, they're happy and they're miserable. <laughs> they're fearless and they're fearful. Krishna's bringing out all these, these ecstatic symptoms of bhav or love from their hearts as he's dancing and smiling and he's glancing upon them. The most dangerous situation in all of creation and Krishna's just happily playing and his his feet which are so soft that the gopis 
feel that when they touch the softest part of their bodies, that they may hurt Krishna's feet because they're the softest of all soft things that have ever been soft. Krishna reveals himself according to how we approach Krishna because the gopis approach Krishna with such love. He's the softest of the soft. But those same feet for Kaliya, Krishna was dancing really fast sometimes. He was going different speeds with his feet, like sometimes on Kaliya's head. And every time he touched his foot to Kaliya's hoods, it felt like a thunderbolt. Can you imagine a thunderbolt directly hitting? the top of your head. That's what Kaliya was feeling. And each of his hoods were being deflated and crushed. And Krishna was going hood to hood to hood, just jumping and dancing until he was on the verge of death and his poison, he vomited all his poison out. Then he started vomiting blood then the Nagapatnis, his wife, his wives, they came and said, Krishna, even we wanted to see our husband killed by you because how he was so mean. But now look at him. He's really in a humble condition. He's so fortunate. Even Lakshmi Devi wants to touch your feet. Even Brahma and Shiva want to t- want meditate on trying to attain your feet. And yet your feet has been dancing so many beautiful steps on our husband's hoods. But now he's humbled himself. Please give him shelter. On the basis of the devotees praying to Krishna, even the most evil Kaliya was given the highest liberation. When great devotees pray for us, there's no greater benediction. Because Krishna always hears the prayers of those who give their lives and their hearts to him. Hiranyakashipu was so cruel. But yet when his little five-year-old son Prahlad prayed, Krishna, please give him liberation. Narasinga Dev, who's an expansion of Krishna. Little Krishna didn't change his form, he just danced. Narasinga Dev, he was very fearful. But because of Prahlad's prayer, Lord Narasinga Dev gave Hiranyakashipu liberation. And he told Prahlad, not only Hiranyakashipu, but 10 generations in the, in the past and in the future, they will, of all your relatives, they will all get liberated because you have taken shelter of me. <clears throat> Mahavishnu, he is telling I'm in ev- he's in everyone's heart. He sees everything everywhere. But still, he wanted to, he wanted to, sh- he wanted Krishna to come to his abode with Arjuna. So now that I see you and you see me, I am satisfied. Here's all the 10 children you can bring them back to the Brahman and they will live long, happy lives. And so the little children, and they were in the, ex- in the exact form as when they died. That means all 10 were tiny little infants. By Mahavishnu's grace, they didn't age. You know, some of them were like 10 years old, but they were still infants. 
and they went back through the Brahma Jyoti on Krishna's chariot. Then they went again through the darkness of that border of the universe, and Sudarshan Chakra lit the way. And then they came back into the sunlit area of the inner universe, and they came back to the earth planet, into Dwarka. And Arjuna gave the ten little babies to the Brahmin, and he and his wife were very, very happy, and everyone was happy. Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna sincerely, and you will be happy also. <laughs> because that same Krishna has appeared within his name to give us shelter. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us not only the path of kirtan, but how to follow on this path of kirtan. Krishna is non different than his name. Vrindavan Das Thakur tells that if you, if you offend great persons, if you offend devotees and chant Krishna's names, then Krishna's names will reciprocate by punishing you. Hare Krishna. But if we're in that mood of Trinada Bi Suni in the mood of a servant of the servant, and we're chanting sincerely and taking shelter in a way that pleases Krishna, then we will find the full shelter of the absolute supreme personality of Godhead, the source of Ananta Shesha, the source of Mahavishnu. Even Mahavishnu wanted to see Krishna. But Krishna loves to bow down even to his devotees. Krishna would bow down to his seniors, not only to show the way, but that's his feeling. When Nanda Maharaj wanted his wooden shoes, and Krishna was just a small boy. Krishna put them on his head. The shoes that were under the feet of Nanda Maharaj, Krishna picked them up and put them on his head and went running to bring them to Nanda Maharaj. And he explained to gopis that even in the entire span of Brahma's lifetime, with all I have, I can never repay you for your love. Krishna expanded himself as Govardhan Hill, and then Krishna, the original Krishna, bowed down to Govardhan Hill. Krishna expands himself as Mahavishnu, and then Krishna bows down to Mahavishnu. Kali Kali Namarupe Krishna Avatar. And Krishna has expanded, not just expanded, he has manifest his full opulences within his holy names. He is his name to give us shelter. And bhakti is the process by which we actually learn how to have the proper attitude and how to live in such a way that we can take shelter of Krishna's names. When Draupadi was being stripped of her cloth, which was worse than death for her, not only was it worse than death for her, but it was millions of times worse than death, than death for Yudhisthira, Arjun, Bhima, Nakula, Sahadev, or to speak of Kunti, for them to see this happening was way worse than death. So to protect herself, to protect her, her loved ones, as she was being stripped by Dushasana, she wasn't like Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. She took shelter with all her heart. 
And the dangers of this world are actually blessings because they help us to take shelter. And sometimes devotees like to select, to requisition, to place an order like you do on Amazon.com or something. <laughs> you place an order for a particular type of danger that will help you in your spiritual life. But those dangers will not prompt us to take shelter. It's when the difficulties, the challenges, the pains, the tragedies, the crises of this world inevitably are there, when they're really beyond our control, whether it's due to our own past mistakes or whether it's just destiny, whatever it may be, when there's no one else to turn to. Draupadi tried to save herself with her strength. She turned to her husbands, she turned to the king, she turned to Bhishma, the greatest of warriors. He could have done something, but nobody did anything. She was helpless. There was a power way beyond her own that there was nothing she could do. She took shelter. Krishna's my only friend. Krishna's my only savior. And he's not different than his name. It's really beautiful. In that situation, it wasn't like there was a deity there that she could start doing puja. It wasn't that there were Brahmins who were going to chant Srimad Bhagavatam. The holy name is Krishna himself that is with us in any situation, at any moment. That's why Krishna's form and his name is most merciful. He's there for us. Even at the moment of death, she took shelter. Krishna gave her shelter. And all these beautiful stories in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it culminates in the 12th canto, the last verse, that we should bow down to Krishna and take shelter of his holy names. And in this sense, the dangers of the world are actually blessings. And the more difficult they are, the more impossible they are, the more if we just are sincere, they help us to really wholeheartedly take shelter of Krishna. And when we see other people suffering, it breaks our hearts. We want to, more than anything else in all creation, the greatest joy is to awaken within their hearts the understanding that they too can take shelter of Krishna in his holy names. Is there any questions? Yes, Ananda Vrindavan Prabhu. I've been feeling such separation <laughs> from your questions. <coughs> Maharaj, after spending some years in devotional life, we come to some very serious conclusion that it is only the causeless mercy of Krishna that is going to give us the highest destination. And uh, we understand that this causeless mercy in Krishna is an autocrat. He can give it or he cannot give it. And we have no rights to demand. Finally, if we see to it that whatever the standard with Krishna is expecting from us, we will not be able to reach to that standard. It's only the causeless mercy that is going to help us to get out from this mess. And we have come to a conclusion also, it is very easy to enter in this material world, but it's extremely difficult to get out from this material world. In that situation, 
when we know that it's only a causeless mercy, because Krishna is an autocrat, he can give it or he cannot give it. We are just like a beggar. If you can give it, it's well and good. If he doesn't give it, you have to go on struggling for hundreds and hundreds of births and just have to wait for it. But in spiritual life, we see sometimes some examples that gives us tremendous encouragement and some places we get discouragement also. There are some great souls like Bharat Maharaj, like Chitraketu Maharaj, like Indradumya Maharaj. Now, these great souls, Maharaj, they have really given perfect Krishna consciousness. They have really come to a very nice standard of Krishna consciousness. But Krishna being an autocrat, Krishna told him, to, you have to take one more birth. And nobody can argue, whatever Krishna says, we have to agree it. So nobody had argued it and they had taken a new birth, another birth. And then they got a destination. On the other hand, we know the cases of Ajamil. Now, Ajamil also had done lots of, if you see, compared to Ajamil and other, these great souls, Ajamil had done much, much more wrong things compared to these great souls. Yet Krishna gave on very same birth only itself, Krishna gave destination to Ajamil. So on one side, Ajamil got a destination in the same lifetime, but these great souls had to take birth also once again, although their spiritual life was much more better than Ajamil. When we see these things, we get frightened. And after all, we are auto, Krishna is autocrat and we are a helpless devotee and causeless mercy is the only case. So, we, 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 can, we just wanted to, Maharaj, I wanted to know it. How can we say that, how can we find out, finally no doubt, Krishna, whatever he says, we have to accept it. <laughs> but how can we check it out that Krishna gives us the case of Ajamil but not like the great souls because we don't want to come back in this place. It's such a miserable place. Again, to come back, who knows what is going to happen and to finish it off. But we are helpless. We have no hope to get out from this mess. But we want to get out and we are helpless. And causeless mercy is the only case. So can you just tell us how to see to it that Krishna in this juncture take us out in this lifetime itself and not want us to take birth again like other big great souls? That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> when you came today, you were not expecting two Srimad Bhagavatam classes. <laughs> <laughs> you have given us a bonus Srimad Bhagavatam class. For Srimad Prabhupada appealed to us to be sincere. To be serious, to be sincere, to practice, to cra practice devotional service with, without ulterior motives. So if we are sincere, Krishna will do what's best for us. Whether like Ajamil, Ajamil also, he didn't get to go back to Godhead right then. He just saw the Yamadutas and that really made him serious. That was worse than death. You know, people die, but can you imagine while wow, you're alive, right between birth and death, seeing the Yamadutas coming and looking at you and about and binding you up and in the process of taking you away. That was worse than death. But in that state, because in his earlier life, he was a devotee, he was actually a sincere devotee in his earlier life, but he somehow or other was distracted. But by Krishna's grace, Krishna knows past, present, and future. He induced him to name his son Narayan. So in attachment to his son, he called out Narayan. But when he did, you know, in that dangerous condition, he was actually taking shelter of the name of Narayan. The Vishnu Dutas came, and he saw the conversation between Yama Dutas and Vishnu Dutas, and he was listening very attentively. If only we could listen to Srimad Bhagavatam class with the attentiveness and the urgency that he was listening, because a lot was at stake. He was about, he was being dragged to a hellish destination. 
And the Vishnu Dutta said, because he chanted the name of Narayan, you cannot take him. He developed really deep faith in the holy names. Then he was allowed to live. So it was like another life, although it was in the same body. He went to Haridwar, and there he fixed his mind completely on Krishna. In the case of Bharat Maharaj, he was distracted also. He became a deer, but he was completely absorbed in associating with devotees. And as Jad Bharat, similarly, he just focused his mind on Krishna like Ajamadal did in Hadardwar. So all of these great souls attained the highest liberation, the greatest good fortune, because the conclusion of everything they went through was they took shelter of Krishna. With sincerity. Ananyas chintayan domam yejana parayupashate teshim nityavayuktanam yogakshemam vahamya. Krishna tells, if you take shelter of me, I'll preserve whatever little you have, and I'll carry what you lack. Krishna will be there for us, but it's important that we're sincere, we're grateful, we're humble, we're sincere. We give up our hopes in all these material promises. This is actually this, a very important symptom of sincerity on the path of devotion that the world is giving so much promises for shelter. If you get this, if you have that, if you are this, then you'll be happy. If you get this money, if you get this skill, if you get this position, if you get this, get to this place, if you have this iPhone, if you have this computer, if you have this car, if you have this house, if you have this furniture, if you have this dress, if you have this jewelry, if you have this fame, if you have this gold medal, there's limitless promises of what will make you happy in this world. But Krishna gives us a good warning. Abhrama bhubana loka puna rabhata norjuna mamu pekyatu konteya punar janmana vidyate. Even if you get the post of Brahma and living in that abode, still you have to die. Still they're sources of misery. Everything's temporary. So to be sincere is to have this, this understanding, this realization that it's only in taking shelter of Krishna that I can be relieved of suffering. It's only by taking shelter of Krishna that I can be happy. All the false promises of this maya or this material energy are only there to distract me. But for a devotee, they're not just... If we're sincere, they don't have to be distractions. They're actually leading us deeper and deeper and in, deeper into taking shelter of Krishna because we can see beyond the lie of Maya. Srila Prabhupada translates Maya as that which is not. That means what she promises will make you happy will not make you happy. What Maya promises is real, is not real. And after so many births of going through it, when we're really sincere, we don't want those things anymore. We may need them to live in this world. We can use them in Krishna's service. But real sincerity is when we come to the conclusion that only Krishna can save me. 
Only loving Krishna can bring any real happiness. And we see other people in this world suffering. Sometimes it's our friends, our relatives, people in general. We see the suffering. We see death. People are oppressed by tyrants, by war, by disease. And we understand whether we sleep in a bed or not, the snake of death is going to bite us. You, the only serum that can enechi oshadi maya nashi bodolaki harina maha mantra lao tumimaki. It's the serum that can rescue us forever from the snake bite of death and suffering. Chanting of God's names. But we, might, we, we need to take shelter. So all the difficulties of life that you're talking about, they're all actually created for an ultimate purpose. To help us to really focus. To be focused. That only Krishna can save me. And when we serve, when we pray, when we chant, when we hear with that sincerity, then whenever, whether it's one birth or two births or three births, it, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is now, with the time that we have, that great autocrat Krishna makes himself available always and reciprocates according to how we take shelter. If we're taking shelter of Krishna, but we're also taking shelter of so many other things of this world, and yes, we have to come back again and again until we come to that conclusion. Krishna is my shelter. Shri Krishna Sharanam Mama. Krishna is my shelter. Sarva dharman prithyaja mami kam sharanam. Abandon all varieties of religion, just surrender to me. What does surrender mean? It means to take shelter. Krishna, I'm yours. Does that answer your question? So just we just need to be sincere. Can we, uh, at least, of course, we have no rights to ask Krishna, but if Krishna wants us to come us into this material world again and again, at least we can beg to Krishna that at least that consciousness of total surrender should remain forever. Because if that will go again, we'll get trapped into this material world and I think that entanglement will go on and on and on. And we might go away from devotional life and we don't know when we'll again come back again. So, of course, we have no rights to beg, to ask anything, but at least that, at least we can ask or we cannot even ask that because pure devotional service means not to ask anything. But again, if you don't ask again, we, are, we don't know where we'll be again. You can ask. <laughs> That's what it means to take shelter. It's, it's a personal process. It's not impersonal. But Krishna will not ask for anything. I will just be in... <laughs> When dangers come, Krishna save me. Only <laughs> what I feel it is, when we have another birth, we don't know we'll have this type of association, we'll have this type of environment, this type of a lifestyle. And if we don't have this type of a thing, that shelter attitude will be very difficult. And then it becomes a create a big problem. So if we don't have that type of a thing, and to get a shelter becomes very difficult. So how to If any of you who are new to this temple, <laughs> if you ever think that Ananda Vrindavan Prabhu's questions will come to an end, <laughs> <laughs> you 
then you are in for a very unique experience. <laughs> what does it mean to take shelter? That Krishna, ultimately I understand that you know what's best for me. If we're sincere, Krishna, you know what's best for me. If I have to take birth a hundred times, if that's what's best for me, I'm yours. We simply need to take shelter with faith. That is why it nasta prayeshu bhadreshu nityam bhagavati sevaya. When we hear Srimad Bhagavatam, we hear the prayers of those who are truly taking shelter. We see what they're going through. They're acharyas who are teaching by their examples. And we have faith in Krishna. We're not the controllers. But we do have free will, and we do have some control of our free will. And through whatever lessons of life we have to go through, we take shelter of Krishna and know that's, that's all there is. And we, as our love for Krishna, ashlesyava padratam tanashtumam, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Krishna, if you like, you can trample on me. If you like, you can embrace me. If you like, you can make me brokenhearted by not being present before me. You have every right to do anything you like to me because you are my Lord unconditionally. That's taking shelter. That's the mood Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught, we chant Krishna's names. We live in this world. We just do our part with complete trust that Krishna knows best. I'm yours. No more question? <laughs> You have all witnessed a historical event. <laughs> Thank you very much.